Well, welcome uh, once again. Welcome this time to the first week of a new message series, a three-week series that we are calling The Power of Patient Love. There are probably quite a few of us here today or watching online that are old enough to remember the Back to the Future movies from several decades ago. And even if you're not, you may very well have seen one or more of them on TV or streaming. And you might remember that for the first one at least, it had a very popular song that was associated with it uh, that was really sort of the title song almost, not the literal title. Uh, and it was called The Power of Love. Now, it would be better for me if it had a different title, of course, because it wasn't called The Power of Patient Love. And there is a good reason for that. The power of love is a phrase that speaks to our experience. Whoever we are, we're familiar with love and with its power. To know, if you think about it, to know that we are loved is one of the great joys of this life. And to fear that we are not loved is, well, not so nice. So like Huey Lewis, we know that love is powerful, but what about patience? The point of this series is to remind us, as Jesus himself does, that patience is also powerful and that patience and love are deeply connected. And then finally, to share some things that can help us, by God's grace, to grow in patience, and so also then in love. And so if love is powerful, patient love is very powerful. St. Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, as he wrote the words that we now have in sacred scripture, St. Paul knew that. If you have ever attended a Catholic or even a Christian wedding, the chances are good that you have heard him say so in one of the readings from the Bible that are very often proclaimed at such weddings. You might even remember how St. Paul's great discourse on love begins. If you, in case you have forgotten, here it is. Love is patient. Of course, St. Paul goes on to say much more. Love is patient, love is kind, Love is not envious or boastful, and so on. And all of what he says is important. But so is the place where he chooses to begin. And he chose and chooses to begin here. Love is patient. Now, St. Paul was, among his many other gifts, a preacher. And one of the things they teach us in seminary is we are preparing to go out and do a little bit of preaching on our own. One of the things they teach us is that any time you do that, you should be preaching to yourself. You should be exhorting yourself just as much or even more sometimes than the people who are listening to you. And so knowing as we do a little bit about Paul's biography and even his character that comes through in his writings, I kind of wonder if as a preacher he didn't put patience in the first place in his description of love because he was preaching to himself because patience for him perhaps was the most challenging part of love. I know it is challenging for me, and I suspect it may be for you as well. Over the next three weeks, we're going to look at the power of patient love, God's patient love and ours, because there's power in each instance. We'll see how God is patient with us. That's really the thrust of our gospel passage today, and how we then are called to imitate him in our patience. Ultimately, we're going to look at this from three distinct perspectives, calls that we're given to patience. We are called first to be patient with God. As I said, we're gonna discuss that today. We are called, and this is a little bit closer to home for us, I think, it's what we struggle with from one day to the next. We are called to be patient with each other. And finally, and importantly, we are called also to be patient with ourselves. This week, as I said, we're gonna begin with being patient with God, and that's because the gospel today talks in great detail about the flip side of that, about God's patience with us, and they are connected to each other. And in the gospel that we heard proclaimed today, we heard Jesus tell a story that's sort of been known through the history of the church as the parable of the weeds among the wheat. And in it, someone, a good farmer, no doubt, plants his field with wheat, a worthy crop, much in demand, one that will bring him a good return for his investment of seed, time, and even money, that will bring him a rich harvest. But as we heard, there is more to the story. While everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. 
The farmer resists his servant's suggestion to immediately try to remove the weeds from among the wheat and tells them that in gathering them, gathering the, the weeds, they would inevitably uproot the wheat as well. Rather, he says, let them grow together until the harvest and until the plants can be more easily distinguished from each other. And only then separate the weeds from the wheat. When he is asked by his disciples what this parable, what this story means in the part of the gospel that goes on from the part was, that was proclaimed here this morning, when he is asked to explain it, it turns out, as we might suspect, that Jesus is the farmer and we are, or at least are intended to be, the good seed, the wheat. Interestingly, Jesus also describes us as children of the kingdom and the weeds as children of the evil one. Finally, in his explanation, Jesus goes into much more and much more foreboding detail, scarier detail, about what happens when the weeds and wheat are separated at the harvest. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will, co they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers and they will throw them into the furnace of fire. Scary prospect indeed. But there is comfort in this story as well. And to understand why, we need to go back to the farmer's discussion with his servants when they first discover the presence of the weeds. The truth is that the servant's approach to the problem is probably closer to the way you and I in our everyday life would want to approach it. The farmer's approach, Jesus' approach, God's approach is different. Both the servants and the farmer know that there is a problem, that the enemy has done his work and that it is unjust to let that work stand. But the servants want to solve the problem now. They want to take action, to make things right, to ensure that there is justice in the world that they see before their eyes at this moment. The farmer sees further. He sees a bigger picture. He sees something the servants don't take time to look for. Something, in fact, that separates Christianity from any other approaches to the problem of good and evil. The farmer sees the presence of evil. And in the end, he will not allow evil to stand. But he is patient. He is willing to wait. I mentioned that we are called children in this story. Children, whether they are or appear to be at this moment children of the kingdom or closer to being children of the evil one, children, whomever they may be, are not yet everything that they will one day become or everything that they one day can become. Who knows what might happen in the meantime? An argument for patience and a demonstration of trust that God ultimately will accomplish what he and we desire. The good will triumph. We cannot forget that Jesus introduces this story to us as a story of the kingdom. And it's a phrase we hear often on Jesus' lips. He comes to proclaim the kingdom. In Matthew's gospel, the kingdom of heaven. In the other gospels, the kingdom of God. And the kingdom, the coming of the kingdom, the story of the kingdom, is a story of God's rule coming to its fullness in our lives. God, of course, created everything. He created us. But only in us is found the dignity to choose relationship with God or to refuse that relationship. And so in us, the kingdom must still come to its fullness. And this parable is a story of the coming of the fullness of the kingdom. And in it, in the gospel that we heard, Jesus uses another image, another story for the coming of the kingdom, and it really complements the one that we've already heard that I've talked about. The kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. Now I know, not because I am a baker, but because I walked through the grocery store a few times during the lockdown and saw the empty shelves in the baking department, and they were empty. I know there's been a lot of baking going on around Brantford over the past few months. And if you know about baking, you can easily understand why Jesus told this story. In fact, practically speaking, it probably comes from him having seen Mary doing what he describes as she prepared food for the family in their home at Nazareth. Jesus knew from experience what he was talking about. Once the yeast is added to the flour, for all intents and purposes, it disappears, it vanishes. 
but all the while it is doing its work. And there's nothing the flower can do about it. In fact, the yeast in this story is even more powerful than we might at first think, or at least its impact is more powerful. According to scholars, biblical scholars, the three measures of flour that Jesus speaks about at the time, those three measures of flour would have been enough to make bread to feed a hundred people. So the yeast, the kingdom, is not only invisible, but it's powerful and abundant, even super abundant in its fruitfulness. That is the story of the kingdom of God. That is what the farmer knew but his servants did not. That the story they were in was bigger than they realized and it had an ending that would accomplish everything they desired. And so the farmer was willing to be patient. Just as God is patient with you and with me. Whether our life today looks more like a child of the kingdom or of the evil one, he is patient with us and each of us, all of us, are part of that flower which in within which the yeast of the kingdom is at work. Now, that we should imitate God's patience does not mean that we should not care about evil. We are called by Jesus in the Gospels, in fact, to fight evil here and now. But as we do that, indeed what we do to do that, should also be done in the knowledge that this story is bigger than this particular moment and that its ending has already been written. And so we should also be willing to be patient. Patient, as I said earlier, with ourselves and with others, but also with the Lord, with God. So I have a little bit of homework for you with regard to that. I would ask you over the coming week to just take some quiet time with God and come and ask the Holy Spirit to help you see how God might be being patient with you, giving you time giving you room in your life to become who he desires you to be. Ask him to help you see that. Ask you to help you see as well where you might be more patient with him, where it might be possible for you to trust him a little bit more and yourself a little bit less. Secondly, on the idea of the fruitfulness of the kingdom, Reflect a little bit during that quiet time or another time. Reflect a little bit and see whether there might be an example that you can recall from your experience or the lives of family or friends where the yeast of the kingdom, God's grace and God's gift, have yielded super abundantly in your life or the life of someone whom you know. A moment where a good deed, a moment of self-sacrifice leavened the whole three measures of flour, far more than you ever thought would be the fruit of that moment. Probably we've all experienced or seen moments such as that in our life. Reflect on that. And if you can remember one, take a moment to give thanks to God for that gift, whether it was a gift that was given to you or to someone else. Give thanks. Finally, and a little bit more down to earth and a little bit more like what we think of when we first hear the word patience, Prepare for next week, we're going to be talking about our patience with one another. Prepare for next week by just reflecting and thinking and maybe make a very short list. Perhaps it could be a long one, but make a short list. Top three places, situations in your life or relationships where you need to grow in patience. We all have them. Maybe just the top three places where you'd li like to grow in patience. Now, the foundation of our ability to be patient with God with ourselves and with others comes from this, something that we know and hold as a truth of our faith. It's not complicated, but it's profound. God is God and we are not. So like the farmer's servants in the gospel, what we want based on what we see going on in this world, in this life, what we see in front of our eyes, what we want and desire may not ultimately be the best way for us to obtain what we desire. Sometimes the road to what we desire, even the road to happiness, must lead through pain and sorrow. And perhaps you have already experienced that. Sometimes that road calls us to patience, to be more accepting of others' imperfections and failings. And sometimes, very importantly, it also calls us to be more patient with ourselves and with our own failings. We all have them. 
It is another fundamental truth of Christian faith that every person is made for the good. That is our destination, that is our destiny. And indeed within us there is a desire for what is good, even the perfect. But as I said at the beginning of Mass, we know we're not there yet. And sometimes, at some moments, the struggle to move forward, to get closer to, the, to what we're made for, sometimes that struggle can seem too much for us. Well, remember, the victory has already been won. We celebrate that and we remember it every time we celebrate the Eucharist. And the fruit of that victory is shared with us in this sacrament through the gift of grace that is given to us also, though, when we turn to the Lord in prayer, whenever and wherever we do that. Like the yeast in the three measures of flour, the power of our Lord's patient love is already present in your life, working invisibly to make you more like him, to help you to grow in patient love.